All right. Well, good morning. Let's get started. Um, last week, I returned from the Sister Cities trip to Morazan, El Salvador, um, and I was invigorated and compelled to do more. Uh, four years ago, when um, the County Executive Legate first established these Sister City agreements with Morazan, El Salvador, I accompanied him. And then four years went by, and I felt that um, we ran the risk of maybe raising expectations and not fulfilling them. And so when I was invited to return, I wanted to make sure that we were doing something uh, really substantive and um, significant to help people. And I'm, I'm uh, delighted to say that I think we did that. We, um, uh, we were fortunate to have a very generous response from our enlightened and conscientious public health community. Uh, three of our hospitals and Kaiser Permanente contributed, combined a truckload full of medical supplies and equipment, which we uh, delivered to the hospital in San Francisco Gotera, which is sort of like the county seat of Morazan. Um, uh, generous county residents donated a total of $11,000, which the hospital down there will use to build a new neonatal ward. Um, now, why is this important that we maintain these relationships? According to Montgomery County's planning department, 192,887 county residents self-identify as Hispanic. That's 18.7 percent of Montgomery County's population. Salvadoreños represent the largest portion of this group. Um, with uh, between 60 and 70,000 Salvadorans, uh, Salvadoran Americans living in Montgomery County. So I feel as a policymaker, it's very helpful to understand the conditions from which my constituents came. I also <coughs> think that the appropriate response to migration is not to build ever higher walls between ourselves and our allies and trading partners to the south. I think uh, that if migration is a challenge, and it is both for the um, communities from which the migrants leave and the communities to which they come, what we as uh, hemisphere should do and as the United States should do is to stabilize the conditions in those countries and to seek uh, more healthy and prosperous um, Western hemisphere throughout the Americas. And so in a small way and in an entirely voluntary way, um, I think we've, we've made that difference and um, I am eager to work with our hospitals to continue this pipeline. They need to refresh and replace equipment all the time, and the equipment that they replace is still functional, but uh, they're required to have the latest and the best generation of equipment. And so um, setting up an ongoing mechanism whereby we can maintain the relationship with the hospital is something I'm interested in, you know, voluntarily. There are not county dollars going into this. I do not in any way expect that Montgomery County taxpayers would um, have government money supporting what's happening outside of Montgomery County. Um, everybody paid their own way. This is all a voluntary philanthropic enterprise. Um, so, so, uh, and in addition, uh, there was a civil war that lasted. Mm -hmm. Oh, Vice President Florian has joined us. Hi. Um, why don't you sit at the table, Nancy? Um, so, after a civil war that lasted for more than 12 years that included extreme violence on both sides, I think that. El Salvador is an inspiring example of a successful democracy that has gone from bullets to ballots. And I think that all of us at a time of uncertainty around the world can learn from the example of what has occurred in El Salvador. And the United States is culpable in the conditions down there, um, both during the Carter and Reagan administrations. Uh, in effect, the United States um, provided the, the equipment and the material and the funding that um, enabled the Civil War to go on. And that was what began the diversification of our local population. Um, in the 1980s, uh, the demographics of Montgomery County changed dramatically, and it was a direct uh, response to President Reagan's involvement in the Civil War in El Salvador. So we have a long-term obligation, I think, to help the people down there. Tomorrow, the County Council will discuss the factors driving the cost of county government. I requested that the County Council staff schedule this briefing so that we could begin to set the stage for budget discussions without the time pressure routinely associated with our operating budget cycle. Mr. Leggett has been publicly calling for a property tax increase next spring in excess of the charter limit. I'm not saying today whether I believe there should be or should not be a property tax increase. I believe it's important that we have a full, transparent, and thoughtful discussion of all of the options available related to the cost drivers of county government so that we can make educated decisions. We need to evaluate the most up-to-date revenue numbers 
and costs in the spring uh, when uh, Vice President Florine will be our presiding officer um, before we consider increasing the tax burden on our residents. There are factors that are within the control of county policymakers, including the amount of funding that we provide for programs, projects, and services, the compensation and benefits that we provide to our employees, and the size of our workforce. There are also, and this is extremely significant, factors that are entirely beyond our control, including enrollment growth in our schools, the state's maintenance of effort requirement, the shift of pension obligations to the county, and the win case, which is expected to reduce our revenue by more than $150 million in fiscal years 15 through 17, and $250 million um, up to fiscal 18. Finally, I just want uh, briefly to talk a little bit about liquor control. The liquor control mechanism that we have in place was established many, many years ago by the state. And the revenue that comes to us has been an integral part of our budget for decades. It is not responsible to have a conversation about privatizing liquor control without talking about how to maintain that revenue stream. I just outlined um, factors that are within our control and those that are not within our control as we evaluate next year's budget. Um, within the next few years, if we uh, don't have the revenue from liquor sales, uh, which is also securing about um, uh, how much in bonds here? It's, it's about a, um, well, I, I, our letter said it was about 150 million in bonds. 150 million dollars in bonds. Um, that's just not a responsible conversation, and it's not responsible for elected officials representing Montgomery County to only talk about one side of the equation. I personally, and I think all of my colleagues, recognize that. Um, both the management and the customer service at the Department of Liquor Control has been unsatisfactory. And that's why our ad hoc committee on liquor control uh, approached this in such a thoughtful and serious way, looking at all of the balanced factors involved. I also know that my constituents complain that they can't buy beer and wine at grocery stores, but none of this conversation would address that problem. If the General Assembly wants to allow beer and wine sales at grocery stores, they should do that. That's fine. That would not harm uh, our ability to balance our budget. But that's not part of the proposals that are before the General Assembly today. And I also just want to say to my very good longtime friend, Comptroller Francho, he did not weigh in during the ad hoc committee's deliberations. I mean, we were very public. We had public hearings. Uh, we had uh, months of public discussion of this topic. Um, I understand he has a pressing interest, and I understand that there is a direct connection between liquor sales and economic development and a thriving and dynamic restaurant scene. That's why we convened the ad hoc committee, and that's why we devoted so much time and attention to this. But um, we didn't hear from our state legislators. Delegate Barkley, actually, to his credit, did stay involved. He chairs the um, alcohol subcommittee. Uh, but we didn't hear from Mr. Franchot. We didn't hear from Mr. Frick. So it would have been useful if they, you know, given their evident interest in this topic, had they participated with us. We want to discuss this in a collegial and collaborative way. The last thing I would say is, you know, um, beer and wine sales in, in grocery stores are not on the table, even though that's a source of a lot of complaints of my constituents. Some of my constituents say they want to get beer and wine at gas stations. I don't think that's wise. I don't think that's a good approach for highway safety. I, you know, there is another side to every one of these discussions. I'm chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee. Access to alcohol directly correlates to domestic violence, directly correlates to highway accidents, directly correlates to a variety of health conditions. So, you know, there's many sides to this issue. It's not just about making sure everybody can get access to alcohol 24-7. Um, so, so I think that the thoughtful and deliberative approach that the ad hoc committee took I would commend to my colleagues in the General Assembly. There is not an emergency here, and I would hope that we could continue to look at this issue in a collaborative way, but the revenue that we need to balance our budget and to secure our bonds is very much a factor in this for those of us who are elected to balance that budget and who have to figure out that responsibility. So I appeal to my good friends in Annapolis uh, to work with us and, um, and not work against us. So I'll yield uh, for any questions that you may have. And um, uh, Vice President Florine, was there anything you wanted to say? I'm mean, glad you're here. I know. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm. This is uh, your time. Okay. Would taxes go up if liquor control went away? I think it's extremely likely that taxes would go up if we did not have the revenue from liquor control. Isn't it true, though, that the, you're talking about not, you're just talking about allowing competition 
which means that this revenue wouldn't all disappear in one piece overnight, right? I think the thing you have to look at there, Bill, uh, your question was whether the revenue would go away or whether we would find out whether DLC could compete, is that the distributors would then have the option to sell to whomever they chose and that many of the distributors would seek vertical integration and favorable relationships with retailers and that the likely outcome of quote unquote competition is that distributors given the freedom to sell to whoever they wish would not do business with DLC and that this proposal for competition is in fact the same as just outright privatization. I, I don't think that I, it's not a question of whether DLC is strong enough to compete. It's a question of uh, it's likely that the distributors wouldn't want to do business with DLC. The letter sent out last week by the county council to the state senate and house of delegates, in that letter it said that um, special orders aren't necessarily special, that they could actually take up a significant portion of mm -hmm. sales. So yeah. how does that... Um, so, what, so what restaurants um, like to have is unique and distinctive wine lists and, you know, craft beers to that sort of you know that when you go out to dinner at this special place, you can get your particular favorite. And so they like to stock rare and hard to find brands. And what they find is, is that rare and hard to find brands are rare and hard to find. So, um, you know, I dine out with my family from time to time. And um, it's been my experience over many years that when you uh, look at a wine list in Montgomery County and you ask the sommelier, you know, I'd like to get that, please. They say, well, we can't get it, gosh darn, Montgomery County. But whereas if you dine out in Washington, D.C., they'll say, well, we don't have it because our distributor couldn't supply it. You know, rare and hard to find brands are going to be rare and hard to find. With respect to special orders, uh, we agree that those could be privatized. Um, we, we would want to charge a fee to the distributors. I know that will be controversial. Any changes here will be controversial. The story of liquor law is a story of competing interests that lobby Annapolis heavily. I have no idea what will come out of this General Assembly session. Uh, but I do hope, as I say, that our good friends, we all represent the same constituents, will uh, work with us and not work against us. Regarding the uh, meeting tomorrow at 2 p.m. and the findings of the report on high salaries, is Ike Lai going to be there to have his input in this discussion tomorrow? Um, well, so first of all, the, the discussion tomorrow is about all of the cost drivers mm -hmm that affect the size and shape of our county budget and why county government costs what it does. Um, the employee salaries are a very, very small piece of that picture. And, and no, I don't anticipate the county executive uh, being present. Um, he very rarely participates in council deliberations. I, I, don't, I don't anticipate he'll be there. But that, that shouldn't signify anything in particular. He very rarely participates. We're going to get a briefing from our staff which has put together an overall macro picture of all the cost drivers of county government, of which employee salaries are, uh, you know, single-digit percentage, not, not a huge cost driver, just one factor among many. Back on liquor control, what are the benefits of it? You know, Montgomery County is the one local government in this area that has it. All the others mm -hmm. tell me Virginia is more of a state thing. Mm -hmm. What are the benefits that you see to Montgomery County having liquor control as opposed to all its neighbors? I want to say that I'm aware of the complaints from restaurateurs. That's why we convened the ad hoc committee. I don't think the Department of Liquor Control has kept up with the times. I don't think it's had uh, strict enough management or good enough customer service. So I'm aware of the complaints and we want reform and we've offered a recommendation for reform that is responsive to the majority of complaints that we've heard which primarily came from restaurateurs with respect to the availability of special orders. Um, Having said that, my own experience as a, cons as a moderate consumer of the product is that prices in Montgomery County run liquor stores are very good. I live on the district line and, you know, I don't want to get myself in trouble, but I will confess occasionally I have purchased products in the district. I found the prices higher. Uh, that's been my own anecdotal experience. Um, I don't find any difficulty in getting access to beer and wine when I want it. Beer and wine stores are available. So, so f my own experience as a moderate consumer has not been that I can't get access. And the majority of complaints that I've heard have been from the restaurateurs. Is that access within the county or wherever you decide to purchase these items? Within, Mon well, we're talking about Montgomery County. Right, okay. Yeah, within Montgomery County. I, I don't, I mean, I consume beer and wine. I consume spirits in moderate amounts and I am able to get them when I want them. So um, the, certainly I think the revenue arrangement has been in place for decades. That's just a fact that we have to contend with. And, um, and also the public health aspects of having uh, licensed commissioners be 
you know, somewhat parsimonious in terms of, you know, we don't have liquor stores on every corner here. Uh, an overabundance of liquor stores in the District of Columbia and in Baltimore City has created problems. So, again, I would not support beer and wines, cold beer and wine stores in gas stations, uh, sales in gas stations. I don't think that's healthy. So I, I think um, there's a spectrum of regulation of liquor that every state and local government is somewhere on that spectrum. And, and um, there are, uh, I think it's 11 control states. Um, it's unusual to have the control in the county, and we're open to the conversation about reform, but that conversation has to include how are we going to continue to balance our budget and secure our bonds. State Delegate Bill Frick, is, my understanding, is suggesting that the voters decide by referendum. Why is that not a good idea? You know, Maryland is pretty restrictive in how things get on the ballot. California is very liberal, and the ballot initiatives in California have sometimes been contradictory. They've made the state very difficult to govern, and they are almost always heavily dominated by free spending special interests. So, um, you know, my constituents hire us as elected officials to balance competing interests and make very complex judgments about budget priorities. It's entirely possible that if this matter is put on the ballot, the voters will decide to privatize liquor sales. And, and I, I understand that this is a popular issue for those that are proposing it. But elected officials are going to face the consequences of how do we balance the budget, and how do we make up the revenue, and how do we secure the bonds. It's extremely likely that the complexity of those issues would not thoroughly and adequately be clear to voters, and that the liquor industry would uh, pour unlimited spending into a ballot referendum campaign. And I think the other side would not likely be told. I would not support spending taxpayer dollars on a ballot initiative. That's been done before. Uh, I, I don't think we should do it again. I, the council didn't agree uh, to commit taxpayer dollars to the campaign on effects bargaining for police. Um, I, I don't think that's something that the county ought to do in the future. Delegate Frick said that it's up to $30 million would in revenue, is that what your budget is? Every year. Yeah, he said it's up to about $30 million. Every, said, every year forever, right. Said in the process of, you know, multi-billion dollar budget that $30 million wasn't a whole <laughs> lot of money. Well, that's great. I hope he can suggest how to make up the difference. I, I really do. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not falling on my sword to maintain county-owned liquor stores, but we've got to find a way to balance the budget. And so those who are proposing privatization, it would be responsible if they would indicate how we're going to make up the difference. I hear often that well, we'll make up the difference in increased sales tax, okay? Except that Montgomery County doesn't control the distribution of sales tax. And Montgomery County is um, very much a donor jurisdiction. We put in a whole lot more in revenues from our residents than we get back. And so if there was a way to set aside sales tax revenue for Montgomery County to use, I mean, I, you know, I would hope that there would be some conversation uh, with my good friends who are proposing privatization. Um, is $30 million a small amount? Is the wind decision a small amount? Is the pension shift a small amount? Is maintenance of effort a small amount? At some point, all of these things aggregate, and we're looking at a potential tax increase. So it's one more factor that we have to consider as we try to balance our budget every year with rising enrollment in the schools and increasing demands on government services. Back to the letter last week that was sent, that was signed by um, county council members, um, it was listed that there, there were some issues in the way that Department of Labor Control operates. Um, I was wondering if you could give me some insight as to what those problems might have been. Absolutely. Well, we have an ample public record accumulated by the ad hoc committee over about eight months of work, and um, we took testimony from restaurateurs who complained that um, their orders were not available when they wanted them, uh, that there were missed deliveries, um, there, have, there had been complaints of um, uh, some truck drivers uh, who were drinking on the job. They were fired. Uh, there were complaints about um, uh, in, incorrect uh, sales amounts, but, you know, again, I think the management issues have been largely addressed. I hope the customer service issues have been addressed as well, but we're calling for privatization of the special orders, which would address most of the complaints about the particular brand and the particular quantity not being available when it was wanted. It'll be on the private sector to, to meet those demands. Is there any need for a sort of source of oversight for the Department of Liquor Control? Well, that we created the Ad Hoc Committee on Liquor Control oh, to provide that oversight. Okay. That's The Council okay. has the responsibility of oversight, and we've exercised that responsibility. Okay. Um, and then I was wondering, uh, Ms. Florine, why, why did the whole Council sign this letter that was sent to the... Well, it was eight of nine members, but I'll let Ms. Florine respond. Okay. Well, because we agree. Uh, it's been suggested that... 
I, I, speaking for myself and I suspect for others, some of us were somewhat taken aback by the initiative that, uh, uh, by uh, the Comptroller and members of the General Assembly, uh, given the fact that we had spent so much time worrying about this up until this day. And so we, of course, wanted to uh, get the story out and share uh, information that apparently hadn't been, uh, well, it wasn't clear whether it had been uh, examined. Has the council received a response to that yet? No, no, yeah, we just no. sent it. That's true. Yeah. So if, um, if it does go on the ballot, you're right, you have the liquor industry and the restaurant industry bringing enormous resources to this. Who would, who would your allies be in, in, a, in a fight like that? Particularly if you couldn't, obviously you wouldn't put tax money into it. How would you, how would you put together a coalition to actually, you know? So let me just say, we're actively talking about that. I mean, I'm not sure that it's worth fighting it. So, you know, I, I would just hope that our friends and colleagues in the legislature would find a way to make up the revenue. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, again, I don't support the use of taxpayer dollars to fight citizen-initiated ballot initiatives or referenda. We don't have the power of initiative in Maryland. Um, this is not citizen-initiated. This is being, you know, potentially initiated by the General Assembly. I think we would have to really talk about whether it's even worth putting up a fight. I don't know the answer to that. That, that would be a political, strategic discussion that really hasn't even begun yet. Um, on a different topic, um, the federal highway bill that's being discussed, um, Congressman Van Hollen and Byer put in this thing about predatory towing. Have you been able to look at it and what it would, how it would affect what you guys would be able to do? Uh, I support what Congressman Van Hollen is advocating, and um, that's about all I can tell you. I mean, I, I, I haven't gotten into an in-depth discussion, um, and I, I don't know if the, if the Public Safety Committee has either, so. I, they, I mean, they haven't responded to the federal highway bill yet, so. Any other questions? Any decisions on the radon bill? How, how, how you feel about it? The last time we talked, you said you had made up your mind. Uh, yeah. Um, there is no question that radon is a serious health threat, and the bill, as amended, would enable the buyer and the seller to negotiate as to who should bear the cost of the mitigation if it's found that a radon hazard exists, it's urgent for the homeowner to, to address it. So um, as a matter of public health, I'm prepared to support the bill. Any other questions? Any advice or that you have for Ms. Florine and how, how have you enjoyed this position? Oh, I've enjoyed it enormously and I'm just, uh, I've just enjoyed working with my colleagues. We've just had a really good year working together. I, I really like all these council members and when you find that um, nine similarly inclined, hardworking, thoughtful, serious policymakers get together, you get a lot done. And at my next meeting, I'll have the list of everything we accomplished this year. It's, it's uh, noteworthy. We, we've gotten a lot done together, uh, and it's just been a pleasure working with every single one of my colleagues. Every, uh, every single one of us have pulled together and represented uh, the county well. All right? Wonderful. Good, good being with you. Thank you so much.